NCSSM class of 99, so I represent NCSSM, yay. <laughs> I went to uh, Duke for my undergrad, and then I went to UNC Chapel Hill for my master's degree, and I was in a doctoral program, but then I left to study of all things renewable energy uh, in order to make an impact a little sooner, but by all means, if you're in a doctoral program, stay for your PhD. Um, so I, I did biology, and then I did um, ecology, and now I'm an environmental engineer. So I work at RTI International, or uh, better known as Research Triangle Institute, um, and I do environmental engineering work in air quality, uh, climate change issues, and renewable energy. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about solar and the big aspect of solar. So we're going to focus on uh, the photovoltaic effect, yes, but I also want to teach you guys um, more about the field of solar in general and what you can do with it. So as you notice, there's equipment up here. And um, one of my projects this last year while I was working for a solar company uh, in the area uh, was to build this um, setup to demonstrate how you can actually build a solar power system because everybody wants to have solar on their house and they want to they want to charge their computers or their laptops or maybe even, of all things, an iPad, which I actually brought today, my own personal iPad, um, which I can charge with a solar power setup, which you see right here. And I'm saving my solar panel for last, so that's why you don't see it up here, because it's too big. Um, so where have you guys seen solar panels today? Raise your hands. Like, where have you seen a solar panel this very day? Have you seen any? I mean, they're ubiquitous. Have you seen any last week? or last month? No, not even last year. <laughs> what if I told you that you actually saw solar panels today and you saw them on your way to class probably or walking outside or what will you say? There probably are some. They're not your conventional solar panels though. So these solar panels are nature solar panels. They're leaves that grow on the trees. Um, they are the, the ideal solar panel because you don't have to build them. You just plant seed, they sprout out of the ground, and they convert sunlight into energy, which doesn't go into electricity, but it actually does create a little bit of a current, but that electron goes straight to an electron transport chain, goes down that route, and eventually powers the entire biomolecular system that builds biomass. So you get wood, you get, um, you get sugars, you get things that you can eat, and the entire food web operates on this. Now, what do you think the efficiency of a leaf is? Have you heard of so popular solar panel efficiencies? Um, name one efficiency that you might have heard, if you can. So um, some people might have said um, that there might be like an 8% efficient solar panel, or uh, you might have heard like 15% efficient panels. I mean, they're not huge numbers, but what if you heard that the entire food web operates on just 1% efficiency? So it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. You have a um, system of plants. They take the sunlight from the sky. Um, they... It, it, they um, it bonds with chlorophyll, and then the chlorophyll takes this energy and it goes to all the way down the, the chain of events in, inside a cell. And all of that energy eventually goes to sugar, which ends up in biomass. And that entire conversion process is just 1% efficient. So when we look at an actual solar panel, which has 8 to 16% efficiency uh, currently available on the market, or experimental solar panels, which go up to 40% efficient, uh, that, those are huge increases on top of what nature has made. So we should congratulate ourselves for that gain in productivity. Um, it, it's definitely something that I think is wonderful, and we, we hide behind the idea that solar panels are not efficient, but you know, compared to what we live on every day, they're hugely efficient. So those are nature solar panels, and I've already covered some of the efficiencies. Uh, I'll mention briefly what efficiencies those correspond with. So if you've heard of thin film solar panels, those are those big black ones that are really shiny. Uh, those are about 8% efficient. Uh, you have the ones that are polycrystalline. If you look at them in the light and they kind of sparkle with lots of little crystals in them, those are between 14 and 16% efficient. And then you have monocrystalline, which are those panels which have the little 
the little diamonds, like they're white, and then they have diamonds separating the panels or the individual solar cells. Those can be about 16 to 19% efficient. So that doesn't even cover the other panels, which I'll show you um, examples of today, which are uh, multi-junction panels. And before we get to multi-junctions, uh, I have to cover the photovoltaic effect and all of that good stuff. So the physics of solar panels. So uh, what are photovoltaics? Does anyone, are, do you know what the term means? Like what, what photo and voltaic mean? So what is it? Light and voltage would be power. Yeah. Power. Yeah, essentially yeah, that's it. Yeah, sunlight to electricity. So it's, uh, it's the, the key term is the sunlight forming energy. So you get actual voltage and power and, and uh, the whole work. So um, photovoltaic effect was first noticed in, uh, in um, not, I don't have an exact month, but it was uh, by Alexander Edmund Becquerel in 1839. Uh, he noticed this effect, and uh, it wasn't until 1883 when the first solar cell was actually built. So it's interesting that this technology has been around for a long time. And uh, um, it was only until the 1970s when it actually became commercialized as a technology that we could use on a mass scale. And part of that was due to how, needing an understanding of the photovoltaic effect, which is related to the photoelectric effect. They're actually two different processes, but they're very much connected. Uh, Albert Einstein wrote a seminal paper on in 1905 about the photoelectric effect, which is when light hits a material, uh, it ejects electrons, and, uh, and those electrons can then go on to make a current. Uh, in photovoltaics, they, uh, the electrons um, jump to a, a, a different energy level or go across a band gap, and then you have the actual um, current being produced in that direction or in that way. So um, we'll cover more about photovoltaic effect later, but just to give you the basic introduction, you take two, um, two materials, one that is um, an n-type material, which means that it has a preponderance of electrons in it. So n means negative. It has a lot of electrons um, because it's actually silicon with phosphorus in it. And phosphorus is, it's what's called doping. The other uh, phosphorus material um, has uh, an extra electron in it. And so there's just these fine, fine levels of impurity in, the, uh, in that silicon that cause it to be an n-type or negative. And then you have positive, the p-type material, which has a little bit of boron in it. And this boron lacks electrons, uh, and it, it actually has, uh, it has holes. So there are, or this material has holes in it. Um, when you have boron, it only has three electrons in its outer level, and so it's actually wanting to get more electrons in it. So you have these holes in the p-type material. So you can imagine a solar panel, which is, made of two materials, one N and one P. And the N-type material has lots of electrons that want to flow over to the P-type material. When you join them together, they create an electric field in the middle. And this electric field then, um, uh, when you shine light on it, it acts to drive electrons um, from one side to the other. So you actually get a current going through in that case. And I have a nice animation of that, which we will switch to right now. Let's see, uh, blank, okay. And so that should pull up and we should have, um, I've got this, let's see, blank again. Maybe it's still coming up. Um, I think I pressed the button. Okay, you have to aim it up. Oh, okay, there we are. All right, so I've got this background at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, which has uh, lots of great information, but what I wanted to show you is at a website that's really cool that you can go to during your free time and uh, learn lots of stuff about solar. I actually went to this website before, so it's called PV Education. And it's the Photovoltaic Education Network. They have a really cool resource called the PVCD-ROM, which you can find right down here. And on here, you get to learn all about the PN junction and solar cell operation. So what I want to go to is the photovoltaic effect and show you this cool animation. So in case my explanation was very long and winded, um, here's the nice animation. And you can see that this is the n-type region. 
this n-type region has these uh, has protons in it, but those are going to be the stationary elements. What you actually have in this n-type region are a lot of carriers, which you'll see later, bouncing all the way around. And they have the colors mixed up so that the n-type region is pink instead of blue. And I always associate electrons with blue, but you know that's not really necessary. So, uh, so this area is the n-type. And then you have the p-type, uh, which has a lot of uh, negative elements in it. But it's actually, um, these are the cores that are stationary. So uh, what it has is a lot of holes, or it's going to have a lot of holes. Now the p-type, um, that material has the doped boron in it. Uh, the n-type has the little bit of phosphorus in it. Otherwise, they're both silicon. Silicon is the major element that's being used in solar panels. And uh, it's very expensive to produce. And that's sort of why the cost of uh, solar panels is so high right now. But so once I click this, you'll see lots of things moving around. Lots and lots of things. OK, so these are the, uh, the holes, which are in blue. And these are the electrons, which are in red. And when there's no, when there's no connection between the two sides, so these are the electrodes, there's no light. This is what happens on the inside of your solar cell. So there's no light being produced. You have all of these uh, charge carriers, which are just on their respective sides of things. Eventually, some will diffuse over to the other side because there's an, uh, there's an electric field there produced by the junction of the two materials. Now, when you add light, let's see, where's my cursor? And you actually make a connection between the two plates. Light generates extra carriers. They make those carriers pop out of the material and go over to the other side. So the holes go to one side. The electrons go to the other to join the holes. And uh, you get a current going through. So this is basically the principle of operation of a solar cell. The goal is to have light shine on a material and produce a current. So there's your current going around. And you can see that the holes drift to one direction, the electrons drift to the other. All these electrons, which are in red, are just being forced over there, trying to go around. The, that field direction there is the direction of the electric field. That's conventional current. So conventional current means that the electrons actually go up the direction of the field. And that's why you see all those red electrons going to the right and then going all the way around. So if you ever have any questions about how the photovoltaic effect works or, um, or just need to refresh your background, this is a highly recommended site. There is a lot of information on here um, about short circuit current, open circuit voltage. There's like the PN junctions. There's um, everything that you'll probably want to know in order to design, to critically design a solar power system and to understand the effects of, uh, of light on solar cells. So, but that's probably going to be covered next week in your class, so I won't spend too much time on that today. Um, so let's see, we have, we've already covered the technology and we've covered how, um, how efficient the solar cells are. And I have one more slide to show you guys before we move on to the actual construction process. And that's going to be on NREL's site, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, they have this wonderful website uh, that's, that has a, um, lots of information on the current status of solar research. So if you go to learn about renewable energy, you can learn a lot about um, process, uh, progress that's being made in that area. Science and technology will have more information as well. And it gives you basically the forefront of technology, of solar technology and renewable technology um, that's in progress right now at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So NCPV um, is the National Center for Photovoltaics. So lots of solar panels up there. I love solar panels. So those are actually the polycrystalline solar panels. I mentioned uh, the 8% efficient ones were thin film. Polycrystalline has lots of crystals in it. Those are the most common type that are on the market today. And the monocrystallines are the ones that are most efficient. And you see those in some applications, but people tend not to like the little diamonds. So they don't get the most efficient model. But, but, um, but those up there are probably polycrystalline. So. Um, so here is the latest chart on record cell efficiencies. And when this loads, you'll be able to see 
the progress that has been made over the years since 1975 when the first solar cell that was commercially developed uh, and, and um, constructed out of amorphous silicon was developed. Uh, it had 1% efficiency, which is about the same as your conversion from leave from, from sunlight into biomass. And then over time, you can see the development of all these different technologies. And we have up here the types of technologies available. So, um, so for example, these early ones were thin films. Um, those are the heaviest kinds because they're made, they uh, require a lot of silicon. And, well, actually, they, they require less silicon, but they need uh, a very thick layer of glass, so they are very heavy. Um, so those are in green, and there's still some thin films being developed, but you can see here they're the highest possible efficiency here in 2012 is uh, approaching 20.3, and those are not commercially available, really. So um, what we're looking at is an average of about 8% efficiency. Now, if we look at crystalline cells, those are your polycrystalline and monocrystalline cells. Uh, those are a little higher. And if you go up to the purples, those are, so these are interesting. So the, uh, we talked about the photovoltaic effect and how you have two uh, semiconductor materials that are sandwiched together and you have a junction, a PN junction in between them. Uh, well, most of the solar cells out there have, they're either crystalline or they have a single junction. Or, well, they all have a single junction, uh, even the crystalline forms, but these are um, gallium arsenide ones up there that are single junction. Their most efficient ones are multi-junction cells, and these have uh, band gaps such that when light strikes them, they, uh, the gaps absorb different wavelengths or different spectra of light. So you can actually absorb more of the solar spectrum that way than if you just had one particular junction that absorbed at just a narrow range of wavelengths. And so that produces this extraordinarily high efficiency of 43.5%. Uh, and that's of this year. So uh, looks like, yeah, or 2011 maybe, or well, it might be 2012. Um, so that is amazing, 43.5% efficiency. So that's just to show you that we've come a long way since 1975, um, and we're, we still have a long way to go yet, but we're there, we have a viable technology. It can be used to, um, to power our needs. Yes? So what is the cost of the most efficient ones? Is it prohibitive? Uh, it is prohibitive, yes. Uh, it's prohibitive for most of us, but, um, but for researchers who have the money to develop it, um, they, they, they get to see the stuff all day in their labs and work with it. And it, it's definitely a great field to go into if you're interested in solar research. But for us, um, we are mostly down here at this level. I mean, there's Sharp right there. There's AstroPower. These are some of the companies that, are, that uh, offer solar cells today. So. Um, there's United Solar, Mitsubishi. Um, well, actually, these are the new, the most of the third generation solar cells that are down here. Uh, they're merging PV, so dye-sensitized cells, organic cells. So those have all um, recently emerged on the market. So they're relatively late in uh, coming, and they're still increasing in efficiency. But yeah, the cost is generally prohibitive for everything but the typical thin film, polycrystalline, monocrystalline cells. So um, just to back up a bit, all of these technologies are made with the purpose of providing power, so providing electricity to your homes, to your businesses. Um, these technologies are, are able to supply power, enough power from the sunlight um, that we receive in one hour to power the entire world for a year. So if we had enough solar capacity, solar cell capacity in the world, we could absorb all the sunlight. If we were to absorb all the sunlight uh, that hits the earth, uh, we could power our entire energy needs in one hour's worth of sunlight that we would have in an entire year. So it's, it's striking how much energy there is. And of course, we're not going to plaster the entire world with uh, solar cells. But if we even just, if we had the area the size of Rhode Island, uh, just that one little area, we could cover our entire country's energy needs uh, for a huge amount of time. And so we just need um, uh, just a little bit of capacity. And uh, it's, it's striking how, um, how long we are taking to build that capacity, but we are working on it. So the future's really bright for solar. 
Um, so without further ado, I've been talking about solar and getting you guys excited. And uh, you see all this equipment up here and you're like, well, what is all this? So uh, I'd like to raise the whiteboard now. And um, why we've got this wonderful picture of science and math uh, soccer team looks like. Um, let's see if that will go up. There we go. Okay. So, and I will blank the screen. Let's see, aim up. If that works, aim up again. Third time's a charm. There we go. Yeah, okay, see, third time's a charm. Um, okay, so today I have this wonderful setup um, to explain how to design a charger for your own use. And from this basic, um, the, the, these, these fundamental um, things that you'll learn today, you can design your own systems uh, with a little bit more uh, education in mind, but basically you'll get the fundamentals today. So what I'd like everyone to do is if you break up in groups of two, um, I'll pass up a whiteboard and you can decide uh, who, well actually I think everyone in the front row can benefit from a whiteboard since this is so big. Yeah, wow, okay. Yeah, and you can, uh, you don't have to hold it constantly and I'll pass out some markers here so, um, and everyone in the back row can get one too. Let's see if we uh, position it right here. And we'll basically have, it looks like we'll have two teams so, Let's see, I'll pass out some markers for you guys. Um, you can each have one. Oh, oh nice there's catch. one. Yeah, good deal there. Okay, and then you guys will have one. And uh, one, and so each of you can draw. Okay, and that's, this will guarantee that there's at least one working marker in there. <laughs> You've got a yellow one, oh no. <laughs> so you guys can add color. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, the projector is off, and it, it's okay that it's off. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, okay. Okay, so I need to turn that back on and hit camera, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll get this technology pretty soon. See, lots of new technology here. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I was going to write on the whiteboard, but um, but yeah, for now I can just use this since I don't need to write on the whiteboard. Yeah, further down. Yeah, that that'll be good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, first of all, before you draw, I'd like to find out what you know about solar power systems. So, what are the things that we need in a solar power system? Electrons. You do need electrons because without that, the process would not even work. Okay, great. Well, where do you need the electrons? Within the two different types of material. Uh-huh, yeah. And where do you find the two different types of material? Within the cell. Okay, so you need, you need some cells, yes. Okay, so let, let's draw, let's see how that looks on here. So let's draw some cells. So we've got a solar panel with some cells on it. Okay, uh, what else do we need in a solar power system? Ah, uh, concentrated solar power. Yeah, that's if you need to, uh, you have these, uh, you can actually put them on the panels themselves so that you can have like little uh, reflect, or not reflectors, but concentrators on the panels that then concentrate down to a really tiny solar cell right there that absorbs a whole bunch of energy. So you can actually save your, um, you can save manufacturing costs building your solar cell by having a big concentrating lens. So that's, that's an idea, and we can certainly incorporate that to our system. System. What else do we need? Lots of surface area. Lots of surface area, yes. Let's make this huge. Let's have a big solar panel. Okay, yes. <laughs> nice big one. Now, how are we going to get the power out of this solar panel and, and put it to some productive use? Like, say I want to charge my iPad. What do I do next? Um, an electric field. An electric field, yes, you do. And where does that electric field come from? So I heard a battery. Uh, but the electric field actually comes from the, uh, the solar panel itself because it's, um, it's, you have an output voltage. Uh, when the sun shines on it, you get that output voltage and then you have that current flowing like we saw in the diagram. So I heard a battery, and why do we need a battery? Ah, yes. So it's like the sugar in a solar, in, 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 a, in a leaf, it's meant there to uh, store the energy for when the plant doesn't receive any sunlight. So, uh, or like bread, for example, where I can have my PN junction and eat it too. So, <laughs> um, 
that stores energy and it certainly comes from plants and it's um, a great little material there for, uh, for demonstration. But um, <laughs> so we have surface area, we have a battery, let's draw a little battery. Um, so here's a battery, it has positive and negative signs. Um, now what else do you need? Do you need something to connect it up? So we have some wires over here. Let's draw a whole bunch of wires. And um, so when we connect the solar cells together to form a solar panel, uh, we get, we, we connect them. Each cell has 0.5 volts of, uh, of voltage and they get combined into um, 18 volts. So they get connected in series. And then you've all had series in parallel before, right? A little bit. So, um, so each of these, each of these. So there's. Imagine that there's. Uh, let's see. There's six of them right now. So if we had, um, okay, six. Now we have 18. So yes, we do have 18. Okay, six times three. Um, so each one of these produces 0.5 volts, and each one of these gets connected to the next in series, and each produces an output so um, of um, so you have total of 18 volts if you have 0.5 volts each and so let me write down can you actually oh that's all rotated there if I wrote down 18 yeah okay that's not I won't write <laughs> yeah I can turn it later but um, but so the uh, amperage the amount of current you get depends on the surface area which we mentioned big big surface area so that's good um, the voltage is set by the actual material itself so and um, and connecting them in series you connect them in parallel in order to get more current out of your out of your solar cells so you can actually connect a whole bunch of solar cells together in parallel and get a nice swapping current so and then you can power more things with it or store it in a battery but that means you need more solar cells um, and, and panels too so i have an idea for you so you have a solar panel and you have a battery uh, do you want that solar panel to charge the battery directly or do you want something to manage the charge so that the battery doesn't get overcharged or undercharged or um, so you need something in there that sort of is like the brains of the circuit so we'll call this a charge controller and I'll just draw this and let's see um, if I do it like that and then turn it uh, we'll actually get the right orientation there we go okay wonderful so charge controller We've got a battery, and I'll draw over here. Ah, there we go, okay. Battery, okay, cell, okay, or and, and cells in panel, yes. And then we're missing one key element here, the thing that we want to charge. So what we want to charge is my iPad here eventually. And uh, we want to charge laptops later on. We want to charge like maybe your iPod, for example. So um, I want to charge this at the end of the day today, before we leave here at 6.30, we're going to charge this iPad. So you guys, um, your responsibility now is to assemble those things together, learning or knowing what you know about circuits, and um, draw me a nice diagram of how to put those things together. So knowing that you have a solar panel that needs to charge the battery and you need something in between in order to um, um, convert the, um, the, the power that comes in in order to charge the battery. Uh, and then you have an iPad that you want to charge at the end. Um, how do you connect those elements together? So take a few minutes if you have uh, like one or two, and if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and ask. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a few tips too. Let's see.
Okay, so somehow we have to get from here to here. And the only things we have, we have one charge controller, which is in the middle, and we have a battery, which fits somewhere in there, so it can't be too hard. <laughs> when you're ready, I'll hold it up here so that everyone can see for future posterity, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, that'll be great. See, we turn it like this. Let's see how that looks. Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness, look at that. That's wonderful. Okay, we're getting there. <laughs> oh, we've got a diagram back here. Look at this. Oh, we've got the sun. That's all important. Yes, okay. <laughs> I was missing that on my diagram, but you know, you definitely need the sun, so. And we've got batteries, okay, connection to the series, oh my goodness. Okay, let's take one more minute and uh, then I'll hold uh, some diagrams up. So you're all, you're all set, oh my goodness, look at that. So that looks cute, you got a little battery there in the sun. Yeah, the first time you design a solar power system, it's really hard. <laughs> but once you get the hang of it, like you actually see the materials, it becomes much easier, so. I'm gonna hold this one up just so we can have it in front of the camera. And um, yeah, while you guys are preparing that one, I'm just gonna hold this one and then we'll get to yours too. So I will point out the things that are good in this diagram. And um, let's see if there are any uh, areas of improvement here that we can have. So we have a battery, current depends on Surface area, okay. We have the sun shining onto the panel, which is, uh, in the panel you have things connected in series in order to deliver an output voltage of 18 volts for a most basic panel. And that's because you, in order to do um, charging a 12 volt battery, you need to have a voltage that's higher than the level that you're going to charge a battery at. So you can force uh, current into that battery. So then we've got a charge controller, and this is going to be a single wire, or it's going to be a cable with two wires because you need to have um, current flow in order to supply your iPad. So current requires two wires so that you can have uh, the voltage pushing current through. So it's good you only have one here because some diagrams are drawn with that, but in actuality, it's going to be two wires. They, they go to your charge controller, which is an intermediate between the battery and the load, so which is the iPad. So those are the basic elements of a solar power system. You have, um, it, the most basic you can possibly get is having a panel with a charge controller, uh, with a battery, with a load. And in AC systems like that, that which powers your house, uh, you have an extra component called an inverter, which actually takes the, um, the current, which takes the, uh, the energy produced by the battery and, um, and converts it from DC into AC current. So you guys have had DC and AC current before? Or at least know what that is? Yeah, DC goes and all, it's all stationary and AC current wobbles sine wave and uh, goes back and forth. So let's take a look at this one. Oh, look at this, it's beautiful, okay. Yeah, this is, oh, people are doing this for my presentation. It makes me feel so good. <laughs> so this is lovely. We've got, um, so we've got the sun shining once again. So we that's a key element because they won't work in the dark. Uh, although there are some solar panels that are going to work in, um, in the infrared ranges now. Uh, they're working on those so that we can actually absorb heat and get some power from that. Uh, so we have our solar panel, we've got charge controllers, two wires going, uh, we've got a battery there, and we've got an iPad. So one thing I'm going to mention with this setup here, um, today we're going to connect everything up pretty much the same way, uh, except the charge controller here has uh, inputs for the solar panel, it has an input for the battery, and it will also have an input for the load, which is the iPad. Now the reason why it has that is that this acts as an intermediary between everything. So the power goes in from the solar panel, 
uh, it then goes down into the, uh, the charge controller. The charge controller feeds charge to the battery. The, the battery also turns on the charge controller too, so you need power for the charge controller to work. The charge controller acts as an intermediary between the load, which is your iPad, and the whole rest of the system, so you want to connect everything through there. And in an actual um, solar power system for your house, um, you have this really expensive charge controller that um, does even more than what we'll see today. So now I'll explain the equipment we're going to use in order to build our system. And you guys are going to show me how to connect this up. So <laughs> based on you have your diagram, so you have a little a place to start. And I think your diagrams are nice and sound. So um, this will definitely give a, a good place for us to start. So. Here's a charge controller, which you can buy um, in a solar power store. You can go online. There's like Alt E Store. There's North American Wind and Sun. There's uh, uh, eBay, and you, you can get them like anywhere. And this one is called a pulse width modulation charge controller. Long word for something that just means that it takes the the current that comes in from the solar panel and um, and sends it out in little pulses, uh, depending on how depleted your battery is. So if your battery is really depleted, like these batteries right here, if they've been sitting on the shelf for like 10 months and they're really wound down, you want to charge them up really fast, then you get yourself a charge controller, which is pulse width modulated. It'll send a huge pulse of current in there, and, uh, and then it'll be a sustained pulse. So it'll bring the current, it'll bring the voltage of the battery up really fast. And then once your battery gets topped off with uh, lots of uh, stored energy, then it'll send little pulses so that you don't overcharge your battery because that's like the worst thing you could possibly do. You can like ruin your battery. And if you've already bought a solar power system for your house and you've uh, invested like huge amounts of money and your batteries get wiped out, well, that's really bad. So you need one of these in order to protect your batteries and to just be there and uh, modulate the current going through there. So this is what we have. And I also have a shortcut here, AC charger, which <laughs> when the sun isn't out and I actually need to like charge my batteries, I actually have this. So it's a shortcut method, but we won't, we won't use that today. Uh, we have our two batteries, and these are lead acid batteries. These are the heaviest batteries you can possibly buy. And um, they have lithium ion batteries out too, but those require a special charger, and so we don't use those with solar charging because of the lack of uh, those charge. Or <laughs> somebody is really excited about this presentation. They're like celebrating with music. <laughs> so. We'll, we'll have that in the background, so that'll just be our little music to uh, celebrate this presentation. <laughs> so, um, so here we have uh, two batteries, and yeah, they're both lead acid, and they have positive and negative terminals on them. And we talked about how we were going to take two wires and connect them up because you always have to have a, a current flow through a, a current flow path through um, whatever you're trying to charge. And then we have the all-important thing, which I saved for last, which is an actual bona fide solar panel. And I'd like for you guys to take a look to see all of the uh, eight, how it's arranged. There are 18 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. I think there are, there are nine here. Yes, nine here, 18 there, another set of 18. They get combined together. So we have a, uh, two sets of panels that are, oh, okay, we've got even more there. So uh, yeah, two sets of panels, and together they feed in double the current that one set would normally do. So, um, and on the back, there's just a little junction box. It's called a junction box, and it's got a little label on it that tells you the specifications of the solar panel. Now, this panel is a 10-volt panel, and you can feel it if you like. It's, it's very sturdy, and, uh, and it's... Uh, no, it was not 10 volt, 10 watt, sorry. It's an 18 volt panel. So, and I've made these little quick disconnect cables to help assembly be very fast today, so. And that's like a really small panel. They can get very large. They can be up to 400 watts, the kinds that you buy at the store. So um, you imagine something that's um, much larger than this, 40 times larger than this. And you can get to about a 400 watt panel. So those things are huge. They're like this big around and uh, that tall. 
and you, uh, it takes a lot of effort to mount them up on a roof. So they're like 75, 80 pounds. <laughs> so this is, uh, you know, I actually used to work for a solar company and we did some installations on top of roofs. Um, it's, uh, it's not recommended if you're scared of heights, but uh, <laughs> I like doing my research and my desk work a little better, so that's, but. Um, okay, so now we've got our um, basic setup and following your diagrams, I would like for you to tell me how to assemble this together. So tell me what to connect first. So you're actually going to be my guide. Whoever speaks up first gets to, uh, to tell me the first step and whoever speaks up next can tell me the next step. So who's daring enough to tell me where to start at? Yes, okay, charge controller. All right, I've got this. Now what should I connect to the charge controller next? Okay, so I get, I get to connect this battery up. So let's see, I'm going to, I've got uh, a little cable here and you guys haven't seen the charge controller yet. Let me just pass that around before I connect it. Uh, it's got three little outputs. So one for the solar panel, one for the battery, and one for the load, which can be like as simple as a light bulb or as complex, complicated as the iPad charger or the iPad itself. So that's what it looks like. It's just a very simple device doesn't weigh anything and uh, it um, what it does is if you get too much current going to your battery it just sends that uh, energy off as heat so it's uh, it's not this type of uh, charge controller you wouldn't use for like a really big home system because you don't want to dissipate all your energy as heat that you're getting excess energy from your solar panel you want to actually use that for something so you would you would put that off into uh, an extra load, or you would just um, send smaller pulses to your uh, equipment and then, or to your, to your battery, so then you don't have to worry about having so much dissipated as heat and being lost. So charge controller and battery. Well, I've got, uh, I'm going to go ahead and connect this up to the appropriate location, which is, let's see, battery right there. And then uh, next, how many batteries should I connect up for a 12 volt circuit, considering that these are both six volt batteries? Should I, two of them? And how should I connect them, in series or parallel? What, what is our goal? So in series, series circuits, the, uh, the voltage adds, and in parallel circuits, the current adds. So if we want to achieve a 12 volt storage medium for the power that we're getting from, or from, from the energy that we're getting from this panel, um, if we have two six volt batteries, then how would should we connect those? In series. In series, great, okay. So I'm going to do that, um, let's see. Uh, actually, since we have, uh, you're taking notes, but you're not taking notes, would you like to come up and help me? <laughs> yeah, whoever's taking notes gets to be exempt because they're doing really, like, they're recording knowledge. So, yes, please come up. So, we have these positive and negative um, terminals here, and we have this cable. So, this cable is connected to the charge controller, and it's going to be connected to our batteries. Now, how do you think we should, we've got a red terminal that goes to a red, so which should we um, pick first? So red side okay so you want to connect that up okay there we are and these these little clips are really easy to come by you can just order them off the web and um, and they are they fit on these lead acid batteries really nicely so all the stuff I bought and I assembled together uh, took me like uh, maybe a um, few days of planning as to getting all the materials together and then it was like two hundred dollars so it's probably probably kind of beyond the, the cost <laughs> limit of uh, you guys but <laughs> and uh, and then this one let's see where should we um, put this one at let's see this is a black terminal so it should go oh yep yeah, so and why don't we put it here because we're trying to do it in series yes okay so do you want to add that one over there and we have one more wire and why do we need one more wire to connect these two do we have current flow right now or why don't we have current flow because the wires connected to two different batteries. Yes, good point, yes. So we need to have the current going from one battery to the next battery over to the charge controller. So uh, I actually have this little wire here, and uh, if you want to connect that, does it matter which side you connect first? 
Yeah, it shouldn't matter because what we're doing is, so this, this is a, an interesting setup. It, usually with a series circuit, you have, uh, let me switch over to the document camera real quick and let's see, okay, we're already at the document camera. So for a series circuit, we usually have um, one coming right after the other. So it's, uh, let's see. So we have, if we have this as a battery, let's imagine these are the plates of a battery. Uh, these batteries are in series. So these common symbols that you recognize, like the battery symbol. So um, these are in series. And if we had them in parallel, they would look like this. So you would have uh, two batteries uh, in parallel, which is why they look like that. So this arrangement, actually, uh, the wires are not, the, the batteries are in series. But it, it looks kind of funny because of the way that I have this line uh, aligned. So you have your positive here, you have your negative there, and then if you were to move them like this, then it would sort of make better sense that you would have uh, your positive, diagonal, negative, and then they go out. So it just it, it's all a matter of the configuration. So it. But, um, but since I have a special bag to put all of this in, which uh, you guys might help me pack up today so you can see how portable it, it uh, all fits, I have them side by side like this, just for demonstration purposes. So lo and behold, the light is on. And we have a light on because the power from the battery is actually going to this charge controller and it's making that light light. So what's the next thing? Now we have, we have two more ports, what should I connect next? Solar panel, okay, yeah, might as well connect that. So um, let me see, where is the connection for that? Now someone's gotta come up and hold the solar panel for me, or maybe I can, um, do you wanna hold it? It can stretch, <laughs> there we go. So let's see, maybe it won't stretch, but you can hold it, okay. We have a little bit of sunlight in here, but we don't have too much. So uh, let me connect it up to this, and let's see if we have any kind of uh, light there. We've got a little bit of a light, and it's not too much. And uh, lastly, I'll connect the output, because that's the last thing, so I won't make you guys ask me or answer, like, what do I connect up next? So <laughs> it's like, it makes sense to connect this one up. Uh, this is a cigarette lighter socket, and it's a 12-volt uh, socket. So anything you connect up to this will, um, will be able to output 12 volts at a small amount of amperage. So. Um, now, the solar panel, if we actually had a light here, um, it would make that light light up really bright, but we don't have that today, so, um, so we just have to um, make do with what we have, and we're going to see whether or not we have an output on this thing. So, let's see. What's the best way to get an output? Um, let me set this down. We've got battery, we've got load. Well. We can go ahead and uh, see the light is on. And if we, I wonder if we disconnect the battery would, well, the charge controller would go off, so we can't disconnect the battery. So, um, but the light is on, which means that we should be able to charge the iPad. Now, here's, well, let's see, where's my iPad gone off to? Is it, is it missing? Oh my goodness, my iPad is hiding, okay. So I've got a light here. And I've already tested this, that I'm getting 12 volts out of here. If I wasn't and I was getting like maybe 30 or so, I would not want to connect my iPad up because uh, it would fry my iPad. So I can go ahead and check it real quick to uh, double check and I will um, get my multimeter here and turn it on. And I've got these little alligator clips, but um, sometimes they work better if you just hold them up to, um, the end, okay, let's see, sorry. I won't make you stand there too much longer. Um, I'm gonna put one here. So actually that should be the negative because I know the outside is the negative. And the inside is the positive. And you should see the multimeter uh, light up here pretty soon, let's see. So I've got that and I'm just uh, going to touch the extra terminal here, and we can see that we have 11.44 volts. So that's pretty close to 12, and it's not that huge because, uh, actually, tilt that toward the light. I wonder if we're getting something. Are we getting anything? We're, we're hmm. Well, it is fluctuating, so the fact that it's fluctuating means that we may be getting um, 
try to shade it. So turn it towards you. Actually, it's okay. So we aren't getting anything because the voltage should go down a little bit, just a little bit though. Um, the current should really depend on the voltage though. And um, so let's see, let me look at, or the current should depend on how much you shade it. So if I, uh, well, let's see, I can't find the, the current setting on the multimeter. So <laughs> this is science mass multimeter. So I haven't been too familiar with it, but um, uh, so at least we can see that there is a voltage and it's close enough to 12 volts that I feel comfortable about putting in my iPad. So let me turn this off and lo and behold, would you like to set that down? Sure. And you can hold my iPad. <laughs> you got the honorable position of holding the iPad. Yes, okay. So now we are going to connect this up. This is a little um, adapter that goes in the cigarette lighter socket and you just connect it, light goes on, we saw that earlier. And it's got two outputs, one that you can charge your cell phone with and the other one that you can charge your iPad with. So uh, the iPad takes about double the current. So if you plug it in, you wanna plug it in? Sure. Yeah. And then open up the cover as soon as you plug it in and show everyone the charging icon. Here we are. It is charging. Kinda. <laughs> it just went off. It did. It was. Let's uh, reconnect it. And let's see. There it is. It's kind of dim, but uh, we'll, I'll make it a little bit brighter so we can all see just for posterity that this actually worked. So <laughs> let's see. Brightness. Okay. So. I'm gonna disconnect it so it goes off. Um, let's see, off, off with ye. Off, 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 okay. Get this off in a moment. On, there we are. So it is charging and it works. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> So thank you for your help in helping me assemble my iPad charger, which I already assembled, but I want you guys to have the experience. And certainly after the presentation, you can come up here and fiddle with the equipment all you like because it's really user-friendly stuff. And um, I'd like to spend the last little bit of our time talking about um, what you guys would like to do with photovoltaics next after you've seen today's um, talk and heard about how cool it is. And uh, would you like to learn a little more about it later? Yeah, so what, what would you like to do? Do you want to have like a solar powered car or like a solar powered house? And you, you, guys are, you guys are helping to make this happen because by having students, by having education to more people, uh, more people are becoming aware of solar cells and solar panels and how to design these systems. And beyond using them as a toy, you can actually have a more practical use for them in powering all our energy needs. And so by having this basic awareness, um, you're helping to promote that education for others too. So uh, it's definitely very useful. And I'd like to share with you uh, some last thing. So um, the PV uh, education website that we just looked at is one good resource. We also have the NREL, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, website that, uh, let's see, PC. And we also have, um, let's see, I wanted to show you um, some so if you ever have a chance to go to their, their Sturm Tech's website, they have this little course that you can take uh, on the weekends. And it's, um, I'll just go there real quick just to show you their um, campus. Um, they have this Orange County campus. And there's a course, it's like $300, but it is a fascinating course. And they, um, it's on solar power. And it prepares you for what's called the National, the North American um, Board of Certified Energy Practitioners exam, which is the most entry level exam that you can possibly take to credit yourself in the fuel of solar. And that exam is only $75, but if you take the course for 300, it's like, uh, it gives you all the preparation you need in just four weekends. Uh, it's an eight hour course, so um, for four days, and it just drills you into, um, it, it really covers a lot of information. So there is a, uh, let's see, under here, where is that? Course descriptions and outlines, programs and study. There was this one course that I found, oh, this is, okay, I'm in the wrong place. And there we are. So Orange County campus. Um, 
there is a solar program that is way way down here and i just wanted to show you guys this because it um is for other motivated students, it says, so you don't have to be a contractor or an electrician to learn this stuff. But um, if you want to design, sell, and install photovoltaic systems, uh, you can take this little course. And I mean, that's like a, a, a little thing that you could do during the summer or so uh, to design a system. Uh, and then you can actually work, help other people install them too, if you like. Um, beyond that, there is the Research Triangle Energy Consortium, which I'm a part of. and. Um, just to fill in our last, since we started a little bit late, um, let's see, rtech, rtp.org. And um, this is a consortium that represents Duke, NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, and RTI International. Um, and they have this program that uh, it's called energy engineering that they're trying to promote. So when you guys get ready to go to college, uh, there might be an energy engineering and energy science minor or second major at each of these institutions. We're trying to get it implemented for all these institutions. So when you go to school, uh, it'll be fully accredited of an engineering program. It might not be under ABET, which is like the certifying um, um, uh, organization for engineers, but we're working to get it there. And so you can certainly um, um, take a look at that in the near future. Browse this website, and it's on the current activity the, uh, where there's more information about this. But as far as resources, I certainly encourage you to uh, look at NREL. Um, that was nrel.gov and then nc slash ncpv for National Center of Photovoltaics. And there's pveducation.org, and that's the PVCD-ROM. Uh, has all the information, which I'm sure Gabriella will uh, go over with you uh, about uh, pretty soon. And then there's this. And then there's also me as well. So I will give you guys my, uh, my email address, and you guys can email me whenever you feel like to um, talk about solar or to ask me any questions. And I certainly wish you guys the best in your solar career. It's going to be um, it's, um, very bright and sunny. So <laughs> thank you very much for having me. And uh, I appreciate it, and I wish you the best.